Dev Rondawa is the chairman and CEO of Fission, as many people probably know. Nick Hodge writes the outsider letter. He's from Baltimore, moving to Spokane. I think we're going to keep it at 222, yeah. Well, at the end, we can do another powwow. Probably better together, I think, yeah. When we talk about uranium, it's important to understand power systems. So that's what I did. I, took, I went to BCIT. I'm, I'm an energy guy. I know electricity. America has an electrical capacity of 1,100 gigawatts. You need to know the difference between a gigawatt, a megawatt, and a kilowatt. Your typical large power plant, whatever it might be, is one gigawatt. China has the world's largest electrical capacity, 1,500 gigawatts and climbing. So if you look at the numbers here, don't get confused by everything. I'm going to pinpoint exactly what we're looking at. They were so successful in green energy, they built 150 gigawatts of wind in only a few years. 100 gigawatts of solar out of nowhere. They also have a lot of natural gas that's going to be coming into China, so as they modernize their coal-fired power plants, this is all going to get smashed on its head, in my opinion. So look at the red box here. We're going to talk about nuclear power. They have a capacity today of 40 gigawatts. 60 reactors are under construction. A third of them are happening in China. So if you look at the 2025, they plan to build up to 97 gigawatts. As we speak, 3% of China's electricity comes from nuclear power. So let's go forward. There are 447 nuclear reactors operating in the world today. In the year 2030, are there going to be more or less? Dev. He's one of these things? Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I think more. And, um, you know, and, it's, and to build a story for nuclear power, you've got to build a story for energy. And by 2030, we'll need 150% more energy. And so where is it going to come from? It can be renewable, coal, gas. Um, the model for most people in the world is America. America, 20% of their energy comes from nuclear. And that's the goal for China. So as you mentioned, 3%. So they've got to go seven times where they are today. Um, yeah, there's no doubt about it. Um, it's got its problems, but it's still the only carbon-free you know, footprint, baseload energy. Um, meaning when we all go home at night, we all turn our stuff on at once. You'd be able to turn it on. So I think there'll be more. United Emirates, um, home of cheap oil, Saudi Arabia, they're all building reactors. Because I think they just want to have a backup plan to what they're doing. Obviously, in countries where they put their finger up every three, four years, see where the election goes, you know, move one or two points, they'll talk about shutting down nuclear, um, and then they realize it's impossible. There's nothing to replace it. So um, even though after Fukushima, um, what changed was the buying cycle. But we have more reactors today being built than we did at the time of Fukushima. So to me, I definitely see higher demand for nuclear power because I see a higher demand for power. You th what do you think, Nick? I don't know if there's going to be more reactors in 2030 than there are now. Like Dev just said, there we're building more now than we did pre uh, the Fukushima incident. And so to me, that says that the world isn't turning away from it. We've had announcements from from Germany that say that they're turning away from it, and, and, and that may be so, but the fact of the matter is that Japan itself says that it's returning to nuclear power. Uh, and in fact, for two years in a row now, the International Atomic Energy Association just had a report out on 2016 that said 2016 was the second year in a row, 2015 being the first, that 10 new nuclear reactors came on globally. And ultimately, that puts the amount of nuclear electricity being generated at an all-time high, an all-time global high. And I think that has to translate into the years ahead as you have, you and I talked earlier, there's two billion more people coming to the planet and they're all energy hungry and they're, 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 not, you know, they're not all environmentalists. And, and even many environmentalists, if you've read some of the op-eds that have been written in the New York Times and the, and the Washington Post lately, they've been, they've been calling for, uh, to become bedfellows with the nuclear agency because they realize that while yes, uh, wind and, and solar are gonna play a critical 
part in the in the future energy mix that ultimately they're they're not base load and until we can get enough lithium out of the ground at a, at a reasonable cost to, to store energy in some in some big way that it could feed the grid then the only clean alternative for a base load backbone is 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 nuclear and and as you said there's 61 under construction right now and that's what I look to the the 61 under construction are going to come online they're not going to be abandoned there it's a multi multi tens of billion dollar commitment and each one that that gets fired up is is China's doing two a quarter now requires one and a half million to two million pounds of uranium just to start up and then you know some other half million uh, pounds of uranium just to keep them running and so you know, while it's it's a fun exercise to, to to look 20 or 30 years into the future, the fact of the matter is, I'm I'm looking for today, and the World Nuclear Association says that we're approaching a, a supply shortfall in uranium. We're we're working through the secondary supplies, and 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 look, the countries that are that are hungry for uranium, that are leading the demand growth of Russia and China, they're going out globally in a big way. It, Dev can talk to this. The Chinese invested a large chunk of change in his company at, at then higher prices, higher stock prices at the time. And so the companies that need it and that are pursuing it in a big way, I, I think, are, are going to be undeterred. The, previously, in, in the old first generation nuclear reactors, they, they were a lot smaller. They were maybe 500 megawatts, half a gigawatt. Today, when they build them, they're a gigawatt, gigawatt and a half in a complex. So you can maybe talk about the amount of uranium that used to go into a reactor, the amount of uranium that's going to go into the new reactors. So even if we're in a scenario where there's 350 reactors, they likely will require more uranium than the 447 smaller ones. Oh, very much so. Um, they're going to get more efficient. So the numbers are always going to move back and forth, 100,000 pounds. or two. It's going to move 500,000. You know, you know what? We can talk about what, what they need. They're new ones. What's the problem? Look, what we're talking with is if I build a story here for more reactors, the question you should be asking is why the heck is that spot price sitting at 20? That's what frustrates most people here, right? So we can talk more reactors, but for me, that's what if, if, if the markets were efficient, uranium would be at $60, right? Because that's the average cost of putting a mine in production. So, but it's not, it's 20. And so that begs the question, fundamentally, why are we there? So whether they use more or not, and other people have got better numbers than I do, because I talk to the Chinese, they don't give me straight numbers. I'm their partner, they don't give me straight numbers, because they don't want everybody to know what they're doing with pounds-wise. They are storing, storing, storing. And so I said, do you need 500,000 pounds? Do you need 250 now? And they won't give you any answers on the new reactors. They won't tell you. And they are the leaders. CGN will be the largest utility in the world in the next three to five years. You haven't even heard of them 10 years ago. They, they have the political will to get it done. We don't. Has everyone recall Fukushima happened in 2011? Yeah, everyone, that's obvious. I, just, I was in Tokyo last week. I spent 10 days there, and I met with a lot of different people. Okay, uh, Japan has a, a power capacity of 290 gigawatts. Because they shut down the reactors, they're operating about 240. What are they going to do? I ask you, Nick, is the green movement, which is very strong in Japan, can these people have an impact now that LNG is globally prolific, the infrastructure is being built up, if they increase LNG natural gas energy production, can the green energy movement derail a little bit of the nuclear movement? I mean, derail is, uh, by by logic, contradictory to a little bit. I mean, if you derail something, it, it goes off the rails. So you can't, I don't think, derail a little bit. You either derail or you don't. Um, and no, I don't think they're going to de derail the, the nuclear movement in Japan. And as I said in my first comments, I think they have to be bedfellows. Um, earlier, I was on a panel where we gave, you know, some of our top picks, and I was talking about Sky Harbor Resources as a uranium exploration company uh, exploring in the Athabasca. And I went over... After that panel, and I, I talked to the CEO specifically about Japan, and he said, you know, I was over there recently, and I was talking to some people at, at Mitsubishi, and they've just made a $500 million, a, a, a half a billion dollar investment into Arriva, which is a, a, a uranium company at this point since they divested the, the nukes to, to EDF. And so I look at, at, a, at a half a billion dollar investment coming from the very place that suffered the, the, the Fukushima disaster. and. And that just says to me that no, they, they're, they're still, they're still going to need to pursue um, 
nuclear, nuclear energy, nuclear capacity, and in fact they are. There's some that have come back online, there's some that are waiting in line uh, to come back online, and uh, since the nuclear capacity has been taken off, Japan has suffered rolling brownouts. I mean, that just shows you how critical it is to, to their economy. Um, you know, when they, when they host the Olympics, when Tokyo hosts the Olympics, I don't think that they're going to want to have rolling brownouts. And so, to me, it would seem they would want to have some more baseload. And, and you can't have that because solar and wind because it's not baseload. Well, I think, it, first of all, look what's happened since they've gone to gas, LNG. First of all, they pay up to three times more than their competitors do, than Americans do for their LNG. So how the heck can you, uh, if, you're an, if you're an export company, okay, how do you compete when your base, very basic cost is three times? Two, um, the levels of CO2, if, that's what you, if you think that changes the climate, like let's assume that, well then, those have gone through the roof. Kyoto, the city of Kyoto, cannot even meet its own protocol that it's set for the rest of the world. Why? Because they're using LNG. Thirdly, look at the current deficit. The amount of money that's going out the door in their trade deficit, because the LNG is such a big part. So um, I don't see a choice. The problem you have in Japan at the federal level, at every level, whether it's court or political, they want to go back. The problem you've got is, same in America, you can get some judge and throw something in front of them and get an injunction. But every time they have gone to the federal level, the pro-nuclear groups have won. And so, at the federal level, the appetite's really strong for it. Unfortunately, at the state level, not. So it just slows it down. I mean, obviously, we're all disappointed that, you know, Japan hasn't come back on. But at the same time, we'll see, I think, four now, two or more, four coming this year. Um, so I do see them coming back on. And so I don't think they have a choice. Because they need the energy, the pollution problem, the current deficit problem, at every level, they need it back. Um, it takes political will, and unfortunately, politicians aren't always trying to do the right thing. They're trying to do whatever it takes to keep them in power. By show of hands, how many people here actively follow the uranium price? By show of hands. So everyone's probably waiting because we all know that it's trading at twenty twenty one dollars There is not a producer in the world that makes money at this price. So common sense would tell us the price is going to have to have one of these lifts. Spot market and there's the long-term contract market. I think Jordan does it very well. You, we spent an hour yesterday explaining the negotiation that's taken place now. So if you're negotiating for long-term contracts, you better have a low price so you can maybe get something more interesting for a longer-term basis. If we're waiting for this window, we, I overheard you guys, of course, in your panel, it's about supply. Almost irrespective of what happens on this end in 15 years, there's a window where the price should have a hockey stick type effect so that something can happen. Do, are, are you in agreement there? Well, you know, like Rick, Rick is a lot smarter than I am. So let's, let's plagiarize him for a moment. Um, if it costs 20, um, sorry, if, if you get paid 20, but it costs you 60, I don't care how much you produce, you still lose money. So, but don't, and here's the problem. We're actually talking about the spot price. That's our problem. The spot price isn't what people do business at. Most utilities are doing business at the long-term price. So that's the number one problem. It, it, it's irrelevant because there's no one in their freaking mind is ever going to sign contract a spot. The problem you've got, utilities, when Japan was in the business, they bought uranium five, ten years out. Okay, meaning they knew the next five to ten years how much uranium they needed and they bid it. The problem today is utilities are going two to three years out. So they seem to think, Oh, it's always going to be low and it stays this way. Guys, I've been doing this for 21 years. I am the longest, apparently the longest fool, uh, CEO of a mining, a uranium company. And I've seen this before. It was $7 a pound. And like Rick said today, he picked five stocks. The worst performing stock when it turned was 22 to 1 on your money. Some made, like Paladin, from one penny to $10. So you're a contrarian or you're not. To me, when it's obvious that there's no way anybody can make money here. But the reason the price is where it is, the spot price, is the way utilities do business now. They're very short-term thinking, and they don't think in the long term like Japan does, five, 10 years out. So to me, it's a great opportunity. And you know what, there's only a few hand, there's a few good names in the business. You know why? Because only a few good people left. You know, anybody that's left in our business right now is a survivor. And when it turns, it turns. And people say, when? 
It's, gonna, it's not a question of if, it's when. There's no way you've got China and all these countries spending billions and billions to get to stay in the business. They're going to say, you know what? And you got to remember, it's not like um, oil. You can turn down a well. You know, let's turn it down. When you put a reactor on, it's going to cost you a fortune. I mean, hundreds of millions to say, I'm going to put it on. You can't do that. So I, I just think it's a question of the way it's the buying cycle. Fukushima didn't drop the demand for uranium. It changed fundamentally how utilities. And unfortunately, utilities, I, I wish I had a, a slide. And it's, it's weird. You'll see when times were low, times were really bad, there's very little contracting going on. Okay, just think about it. When prices are low, they don't do a lot of buying. The moment the prices spiked, they did all their buying. Well, who the heck does that? Right? What normal person says, I'm not going to buy when things are low. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to wait till they're high. Well, if you guys all did that, you wouldn't be coming to very many shows. Well, that's what they do. And we've got a chart at our booth, and I'm happy to show it. Whenever the prices were low, volumes contract was low. As soon as they shot through the roof, they started buying. They act like lemmings. So, I mean, it's a lovely chart. It shows you the mentality of the utilities. No, good comment there. Just any, any quick uh, ending comments for you, Nick, on a suggestion for the crowd, perhaps? I would just add that it, that it could go, the price can go high very quickly because while the utilities will wait until prices start to rise to contract, they're relatively price agnostic because the cost of uranium to, to run a uh, reactor is such a small, small fraction of the overall cost of building it and running it and maintaining it and decommissioning that they don't care if uranium is $35 pound, dollars a pound or $75 a pound. It's, it's irrelevant to them. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. I will also, just to, for open disclosure, I strongly suggest people follow the sector very closely, energy in general, so you're current, you know, because it is, it's not static, it's Progressville. And I also, my friend Jordan, um, I'm a shareholder of Sky Harbor, I know a lot of people have recommended it. Very few companies in exploration stage uranium, and I'm in it for the discovery success. Now, if I get a higher uranium price, fantastic, but if a good team gets a good discovery, going to make money. So that's also a good education tool and uh, just a plug for you guys. So I'm a, I own that one as well. Um, thank you guys.